Hey everybody, welcome back. We've got... Thank you for that, DJ Khaled. So, just to catch everyone up to speed, there has been a delay in the posting of this particular lecture. So, I just want to remind everybody the concepts that we already covered. And then, finally, I'll let you know what we're going to cover in this lecture. There's one more to follow. Yes, I know. But the last one is super short. It's just a review of the entire chapter four. All right, so here we go. This is what we've covered in chapter four so far via lecture. Um, we looked at the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote. We studied the layout of the nucleus, talked about its importance. There was a discussion about surface area to volume ratio for cell sizing which gives us an explanation for why cells being small and having um, a larger surface area is better. Then we discuss the pathway um, through a cell. We looked at the organelles that are involved in the endomembrane system. We also talked about something called the endosymbiont theory. Um, I reviewed this more in class. And let's see what else. Oh, the very last thing was powerful organelles. So we looked at the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Peroxisomes were thrown in there with the mitochondria and the chloroplasts because of their um, ability to act as an oxidizing um, agent. So in this lecture, what we're going to cover just very quickly, cellular transport, so moving things within a cell, um, the cell being in motion itself, so the motility of a cell, how does it get around, can it move, where is it going, um, it depends on the cell type. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about the environment that lies just outside of the cell membrane. Um, it's called the extracellular matrix. You will hear me refer to it as the extracellular matrix, but I also want you to be aware that abbreviating it is something that happens too, so it's called the E. C M extracellular matrix. All right, let's get going. So the first concept that we're going to look at for this whole, the birds are like going crazy outside. And then as soon as I say the birds are going crazy outside, they stop. Okay, so we're going to talk about the cytoskeleton, which is basically like a gigantic network within the cell. Um, like a highway system or a railway system we transport not we transport but cells are able to transport organelles and other things that are in need of transport debris waste um they all have to be moved along this cytoskeleton hold on because the birds are like they're being weird Okay, so they're still being weird, but I just closed my window, so now I cannot hear them anymore. So yeah, what I was trying to get at was that inside of the cell, in the cytoplasm, we have these railway or highway systems where we can transport organelles or move things throughout the cell. The name of this transport system is called the cytoskeleton. It's made out of um, three different types of fibers that we're aware of, and in addition to helping with cellular transport, it also gives the cell some structure. All right, really quickly, in this video, what we're going to see is that the center mass, where like all of those little black specks are, they're going to move. The wispy um, string-looking material, that is the cytoskeleton. Pay very close attention to how the teeny black dots only move on the cytoskeleton track. All right, it looked like things were going in and coming out in that slide, but that's kind of how it works. Nothing is going to move on a, on a space where there's no cytoskeleton. All right, let's look at now organelle movement inside of a cell. Again, this has to be done on these cytoskeleton tracks. So in this video, 
we can't actually see the cytoskeleton but you can see the organelles being transported and you can tell that there's like a line that they're following it's not random so that was that one all right here's another one for organelle transport this one is a little bit different because we can actually see the pieces of cytoskeleton they look like worms watch how they move look at the organelles that ride across them so they shift back and forth as needed sometimes they cross paths with another um, cytoskeleton track I guess and then that's how we're able to transport organelles throughout the cell Notice the different sizes. All right, so let's now look at the role of the cytoskeleton in support and also motility. Um, so we know that cells have definite shapes. Um, if you've taken anatomy and physiology or even had a bio class prior to this or maybe you're just curious and you look under microscopes I have no idea but what you'll see is that the cells have specific shapes to them so why is it that they take on this globular shape or why is it that some of them look flat and stretched out it really really has a lot to do with the support that the cytoskeleton is going to give these cells in addition to their function of course like neurons need to be long so that they can talk to one another um you know like um from from your toes all the way up to your head um so yeah the cytoskeleton is going to help with keeping the correct shape of the cell in addition to that it also kind of roots organelles in place so they're not just like sloshing through um the cytosol they are fixed and their position is fixed because of the cytoskeleton um, then the third bullet point is telling us that these cytoskeleton filaments they're able to interact with something called motor proteins and motor proteins literally help the cell move um, and so cells that move are things like flagella and cilia and we'll get to that towards the end of this um, the final bullet point is just letting you know that the vesicles that we talked about being made from like the Golgi body or um, if something was coming from the endoplasmic reticulum going to the Golgi body it was put in, in a vesicle we have to transport that some kind of a way and in the previous lectures all we did was just say it kind of floats from one organelle to the next until it's finished being processed and then it's ship wherever it needs to go but in reality the path that those vesicles take will depend on the presence of the cytoskeleton within the cytoplasm um, so it's not random it's orchestrated and it keeps the cell ordered so here's a first there's a uh, just a model at the top for um for image a so it says motor proteins they walk and they have it in quotation marks because it's not actual walking it's like kind of it looks like a waddle like they kind of waddle along this microtubule or like um, this cytoskeleton piece and they carry with them the vesicle that contains whatever it is that we have made or maybe it's something that we've taken in that we need to break down so when we're transporting this vesicle um, you're gonna have these motor proteins that are actually moving the vesicle along the vesicle itself is not just like you know free floating out there um, kind of like an astronaut in outer space I guess and then so for example B or rather for image B they're giving you a um, scanning electron microscope view of the same model that they have above 
and you can clearly see the microtubule it's labeled and then they show you the vesicles you're not able to really see the motor proteins though so we've talked about the function of the cytoskeleton here we're going to talk about the pieces that actually contribute to the cytoskeleton so you have three different types of fibers that you're going to find um, they list them here so they have the first one listed as microtubules these are going to be the largest or the thickest of the three um, microfilaments are the smallest they're also called actin filaments um, so not smallest but thinnest is the word they use here and then the intermediate filaments they're intermediate they're right in the middle um, so the diameter of these ones is going to be somewhere in between a microtubule and a microfilament all right so in this video they're going to show us actin which is one component of the cytoskeleton that has those motor proteins um, that are going to help with movement so I'm going to hit it again kind of just looks like a, a stream of lines coming towards some mass in the center nothing too crazy about the last one all right so this one is a video of actin again but this time in a neuron and that was it really quick all right now we're moving on we're gonna look at in a plant cell um, the movement of chloroplasts notice the direction in which the chloroplasts were um, rotating it looks like they're going counterclockwise um, and I'll hit it one more time and just in case you need an area to focus on look um, right around here all right so pay attention to the way that the side I mean excuse me the chloroplasts are moving all right so they're going around counterclockwise all right and this one is cytoplasmic streaming so this time we're talking about the cytoplasm so the space between the nucleus of a cell and its plasma membrane um, and, and, and and it itself is going to move in this video all right so again literally by the cytoplasm moving you have this movement of the chloroplasts and they're staying fairly close to the plasma membrane as they're moving um, and they're all moving in a counterclockwise direction kind of cool here's another one now we're looking at microtubule um, movement itself looks like fireworks again more microtubule movement um, this one is fluorescence though They all kind of have like a firework kind of a look to them. Um, all right, so this slide here I've doctored up a little bit. Um, the picture at the top was the one that was provided from the textbook, and it's listed as figure 4.20, um, and is showing the cytoskeleton. What I wanted to point out though is that you see a bunch of different colors up there. Um, and so the question may be like well why is it that if all of those are parts of the cytoskeleton they are coming up as a different color and it really has to do just with the chemistry of this um, fluorescent stain that we're seeing um, so you have on the left side they're showing you tubulin dimers which have a diameter of about 25 nanometers so they're pretty thick um, so that would be a microtubule on the left on the right hand side oh and by the way they're staining green so whenever you see this green fluorescence 
we're talking about a microtubule. On the right side, though, we're looking at an actin subunit. So remember, actin is a microfilament. It's the thinnest of the three different types or three different fibers that make up the cytoskeleton. And the way that it reacts to whatever this stain is, um, it gives you like a reddish fluorescence. So whenever we see that, we know that we are actually looking at microfilament. So now we're going to just kind of dissect each of these pieces individually and talk about what their individual um, functions are. So microtubules, remember these ones are the, the largest of the three. Um, they give you a nanometer range for them. They tell you what they're made out of. They say tubulin, it's a dimer consisting of an alpha tubulin and a beta tubulin um, piece. And its job is um, to maintain cell shape, help with cell movement, um, chromosome movement, cell division, so like mitosis, and then organelle movement. Now we're on to the second type of fiber that we can find within the cytoskeleton realm. Um, we have microfilaments. So notice the red stain, just like um, in the first slide that we were looking at with the three different colors present in um, figure 4.20. Uh, there are two strands here. They are kind of like um, braided or twisted together. The job of these is to help maintain cell shape just like the microtubules. Um, additionally, they can help with changes within the cell shape itself. So I don't know if the cell maybe needs to be a little bit flatter or wider. This particular filament could assist in that. Um, you hear about actin and myosin when you talk about um, muscle tissue. So they have listed here that it helps with muscle contractions. It also is responsible for cytoplasmic streaming, which is what we just looked at in those videos where those chloroplasts were moving in that counterclockwise direction. Um, and then they help with cell motility and cell division again in us. So cell division as in mitosis. All right, and then here's our intermediate filament. This is what stains that green color. Um, you'll notice that the diameter is in between the microfilament and the microtubule. Um, there's a bunch of different proteins that are made up of this particular fiber of cytoskeleton. So they list keratin there. Think about your hair, fingernails, um, things like that. So this one is maintaining shape too. All three of them work to do that specific job and that's why that was a blanketed statement at the beginning of this concept. Um, they help to keep organelles in place. That's why you see there's like so much of them. Um, they look like they outnumber the microfilaments and the microtubules but I guess it would really just depend on what cell you were studying. Um, let me see what else does it do oh they put here specifically that it's gonna anchor the nucleus in place um, and it helps with the formation of the nuclear lamina so when we were looking at the nucleus um, by itself just as an organelle we studied the, the various parts of it the nuclear um, lamina was in there you're more than welcome to go back and look at it try to put some context to this particular slide in reference to the nuclear lamina. All right, so let's talk about microtubules very briefly. We've already just done this in the picture slides. So they're hollow, they're made out of glo globular proteins. Um, the functions are there, same functions that we just talked about. So we're keeping in line with the whole microtubule idea this is placed here because um, the centrosomes and the centrioles, they actually are made out of microtubules. They list on the first bullet point that in an animal cell, so us, you know, a pet, um, a bird, any, any eukaryotic animal cell, 
you have these microtubules that are going to grow out from the centrosome. So that's their point of origin. Um, the centrosome, it helps to kind of keep the microtubules organized. And then also, you have these pair of centrioles. They're made out of microtubules. And their microtubules are arranged in a specific order. So there's like a 9 to 2 configuration um, that we see with these. I'm going to hit play and this lady's going to talk to you guys. Flagella or singular flagellum and cilia or singular cilium are microtubular structures that extend outside some cells and that assist in moving the cell or the cell's surroundings. Flagella are much longer than cilia. When a cell has cilia, their number is large, whereas a cell will have few flagella or a single flagellum. Many protists have cilia, and the sperm of many plants and animals have flagella. Flagella and cilia are assembled from tubulant subunits organized to form a circular arrangement of nine pairs of microtubules attached to a centra pair. Flagella and cilia bend to cause movement of either the cell or the surroundings. The bending uses energy derived from the hydrolysis of ATP. So there you have it. All right, this video of ciliary motion, I'm just going to tap play, look at it for a couple of seconds. It just looks like um, like maybe water's rushing over sand. That's the kind of image that I get. So let's talk about cilia and flagella and what they can do for a cell. So you just saw the cilia, let's look at the flagella and sperm, because why not, right? So you can see the flagella like flips back and forth rapidly. More sperm, so flagella microtubule. And it's off to the races. More sperm. Okay, so I don't like the tail on the end of that one. It's a little strange, but yeah, it's still a flagellum. All right, now we're back to this idea of cilia. So if you had a chance to look at the protists that we had that were in those tubes, um, paramecium were a part of it. So, oh, look at that 3D spin. That was amazing. Anyway... Basically, this guy is covered in these small projections called cilia. Um, they're showing us different contrasting colors behind it. And they point out the cilia. You probably have to go back and pause it and maybe even try to like tap in to enlarge the video or something. But um, they definitely did just show the cilia. They're just very, very small hair-like projections um you can see them really well if you had an electron microscope um unfortunately we don't have that kind of equipment so you won't be seeing any cilia at blair at least not through a microscope not that i know of anyway all right now we're looking at the picture of that centrosome centriole talk that we just had um so on this slide we go back to that whole model cell idea Remember, not all cells have all of these parts. Some cells may have more of one specific organelle than another, but we have found these structures here. They're called centrioles. There are two of them. When you look at the pair of them, they're referred to as the centrosome. Um, and they're made out of microtubules in that configuration that we saw in the video a couple slides back when the Pearson people were talking to you guys. So now here's our text version of what cilia and flagella are all about. So you have microtubules that are going to help with um, moving of the cilia as well as the flagella. Um, the flagella usually stick to only um, being present in either by itself, so one, or to have like two, maybe two flagella attached. I was asked in class um, whether or not 
an, a, like an organism could have flagella that were like on opposite sides of a cell and I I've never seen anything like that however there are mutations that can occur I guess like it is possible but I imagine somebody being like in a rowboat and then like moving the oars the wrong way and spinning in a circle around and around and around so I think that's probably what would happen if you have flagella that were on two separate sides of a cell membrane um that they would oppose each other so the idea here is to work in unison and what's really interesting about the cilia is that there's so many of these hair-like projections but they still have to kind of be um synchronized in order to get like how we just saw that paramecium moving or um even like there are some cilia in I, in certain parts of like lung tissue so if you think about when you get a cold or if you're sick and maybe you're trying to cough up some of that mucus or phlegm that's being produced um those ciliary hairs or projections i shouldn't call them hairs but the cilia is what is helping to kind of um cause the the pushing up of that phlegm so that you can you know just get get it out um so cilia and flagella even though they're both there for motility, they do have their differences, not just numbered. The last bullet point is just speaking on how they can differ in the way in which they move. So their beating patterns are different. So when we look at how um, cilia are attached and how flagella are attached, this is what we see. We see that both of them are going to have um, microtubules. They're going to be wrapped up by a plasma membrane so technically you could still consider these organelles um, they're part of the cell they're membrane bound they have a job um, you know a specific function so another thing that we notice with them in addition to the composition being that of um, microtubules and them having a plasma membrane we see that they're attached to the to the plasma membrane via a specific place called uh, they call the place a basal body so basal bodies they anchor the cilia or the flagella so that it stays in place and then last but not least on here they mention um a specific motor protein that is that's involved in no kingston no kingston i'm sorry it's my son so um, they both have a motor protein that they're using to make their motion happen. Um, I don't think this will come up on any test questions or anything, but it is good to know, um, I guess, like the name of the protein that's ha um, helping it to propel itself forward or, you know, move something along. Figure 4.23 is giving us the structure of a flagellum and the structure of a cilium. They're showing you two things. So one, they give you um, a longitudinal section and they say that this particular one that we're looking at, I'm gonna highlight it, this one here, A, longitudinal section of motile cilium. They cut it through so that you can see it um, and they show you where the basal body is notice the plasma membrane right there and the the microtubule that makes up this motile cilium is anchored into the plasma membrane the area where that happens is called the basal body so that describes how those words can be used together um, the the B illustration and actual like scanning electron microscope image is giving you a cross section a cross section this time of the of the cilium so with the cross section we can see this um, 9 plus 2 uh, I guess like how do I want to say it we, we, we see this 9 plus 2 configuration basically of how these microtubules are like placed together um, and this is what is going to help with the movement. Um, so if you were to count, why is it 9 plus 2? You have 2 in the center. They're 9 all around. 
Um, they show you cross-linking proteins, where they're located. They give you a name for the space that's in between the central microtubules and those that are on the outer ring. Um, they call that the radial spokes. They show you where motor proteins would be located to help the motion along. Because remember, we talked about um, how the motor protein is what's going to be responsible for pushing things forward. Um, and then... At the bottom, we get a cross-section of the basal body. So here's image C with its scanning electron microscope slide picture. This one, though, is in a triplet. So this is a little bit of a different configuration. Um, so let's count really quickly. One, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So notice that there are nine here. I was asked in class by a fourth period student about a nine plus zero combination. And for a second, I was like, I have no idea what that is. But then when I sat back down to review this, I was like, oh, that's what they were referring to. So this is the one that would be that nine plus zero configuration up at the top where B is. That's the nine plus two configuration. Again, that was a question on like a dynamic study module. I cannot think of any like reason why I would stick this on a test. It's kind of just like a factoid thing. All right, so how does this protein um, work? So you have this contraction um, and movement and then a release of these outer microtubules. And then those um, couplets, or they call them doublets here, and that central pair, they're held together by these cross-linking proteins. We saw them in the diagram. And then finally, you have um, this motion that's going to happen because the doublet um, arms, they're calling them, they make the cilia or the flagella like, you know, bend back and forth. So that was the animation. Again, this is just like it written out for you to see. Take notes. Finally, onto microfilaments. So same spiel as before. Um, they're thin, or they're the thinnest of the three. They play a role in structure. We already talked about this. Um, oh, so the last bullet point, I guess, is something that's kind of new. So here... They're telling you that if you bundle these microfilaments, they're going to help make up the core of something called microvilli. Um, microvilli are these like, um, they kind of look like carpet fibers, I guess, like um, within an intestinal cell. And they actually help to increase like the surface area of these intestinal cells, which makes for um, rapid absorption or absorption that would happen more rapidly than with I don't know say some other cell in your body it's kind of interesting so there it is um, picture of what I was just saying the microfilaments are there they're showing you how they serve as an anchor so here and then you see the microvilli or villus as they put here um, and then they show you the plasma membrane that like in encompasses them or it wraps itself around them okay so on this slide we're looking at or exploring further how a microfilament is going to work for that contraction and that relaxation like a muscle cell would do um they list the word here myosin that was the other um i guess like not part it's a protein it was the other protein I mean it was the other thing I named when we were talking about the filament the microfilament actin actin is the actual microfilament and it's going to interact with this protein called myosin so actin and myosin they are working in unison to help with the contraction and relaxation of muscle cells um, so they give an example in the second bullet point they're talking about how actin and myosin cause these muscle contractions they also help with something called amoeboid movement of white blood cells so if you ever get a chance in your spare time to look at this that's great if not we do look at it in class at some point um, but we talk about the immune system 
the white blood cells, they have these things called um, macrophages or macrophage. I don't care how you want to say it, but like, you know. So macro just means big and then phage or phage, it's going to like engulf something. Um, and so the way that these things look, they look like um, a fried egg, like if it was just like splat in a pan and fried up, you know. Uh, so it's not moving anymore. But imagine if that thing could like, I don't know, like stick out one end and like sludge itself along to capture something. That's kind of what it looks like. So it would take on this really weird shape. It'd be like um, something like this maybe. And then so what would happen is this one region maybe would like extend itself forward and it would pull the rest of the cell with it. So this amoeboid movement is able to happen because of the microfilaments um, actin interacting with the protein myosin. Um, and then last but not least, they have it responsible for the cytoplasmic streaming in plant cells. We already saw it. Remember, they were moving in that counterclockwise motion. We're repeating ourselves at this point. All right, intermediate filaments straight in the middle. Still the same job as they had a couple slides back. They're going to help with keeping things in place. Um, they're the in-between of the microfilament and the microtubule. Filament being the small one, tubule being the larger one. So concept 4.7, this is the only other concept in this video. We're talking about that ECM piece that was at the bottom of the very first slide. And for those of you who do not remember, um, ECM stands for extracellular matrix. Um, when we look at the extracellular parts, we see that they can help to also coordinate what happens from one cell to the next. So we know that cells are meant to make things. We know that cells are also meant to um, export the things that they make um, to give it maybe to another cell. Or maybe it's just supposed to like leave the cell and be in that um, inner membrane space, like in between the two cells. So in that extracellular matrix. So what happens is once the cell has finished, I don't know, producing whatever, or getting rid of whatever, there are other cellular functions that are going to be carried out because that particular whatever it is, is pushed out of the cell causes like a cascade of events in other words that's what I'm saying so when we look at like the cell wall of a plant right we think about how tightly packed plant cells look um, one thing about them though is that they have this extracellular feature called a cell wall and you guys are very familiar with what a cell wall is especially after the campaign wars or the most important organelle election of 2017 shout out mitochondria anyway um so yeah let's go back to this the cell wall they call that an extracellular structure you also have things like um proteins and carbohydrates in it as an extracellular structure but right now just in plants just the cell wall is all they're talking about what is the cell wall's job it helps keep the plant okay so making sure all the internals are good it's going to help it keep its shape. It also help it um, not to swell and then lice. Um, so the, the cell wall is important. It's made out of cellulose fibers, which are carbs. Um, and then within the cell wall, this is interesting, you have these fibers of other polysaccharides. So the cell wall is not just the cell wall by itself. It's the cell wall plus polysaccharides and even some proteins. So more carbs, more proteins help make up the cell wall. Um, what's another thing that they're talking about here? Now they're talking about the parts that make up a cell wall. All right, Clara hit me to the middle lamella. She asked me what it was and I was like, dude, I have no idea. I've never heard of that before. But now I know. Um, but I'll probably forget it just because I, I've never really been interested in the layers of a cell wall. I guess it's kind of cool. Um, so the cell wall itself has some layers. That's all you need to know. 
But this is the big one, the plasmodesmata. It does come up or it can come up. They're just like these tunnels that go from one plant cell to the next. They allow for like easy exchange of fluid. Um, so yeah, we don't necessarily have to put stuff into the extracellular space in order for plant cells to be able to, you know, move things back and forth. The plasmodesmata work just fine. All right, and then here's our picture of it. So notice that there is no really um, large extracellular matrix. There's no ECM in between these cells, not the way we see in animal cells anyway. Um, but they do break down for you where the plasmodesmata are. Notice like here, right? So there are four little tunnels in that one. Sometimes it may just be two. Um, there's I don't know if there's like a specific pattern or configuration that gives you know four plasmodesmata here and two in the next one I have no idea but that is how we're gonna push stuff from cell to cell in a plant cell but for us now we're actually looking at the real deal the real ECM so our extracellular matrix um it's more elaborate that's what they're saying here it's more elaborate that's what i was gonna say hey book you took my idea um but anyway our ecm so what's in there there's a whole bunch of stuff in there let's let's look at a picture the picture is much better than the words it's easier for me to talk you through this when you're looking at the picture so look first let's orient ourselves if we look from here down we are in the cell that was my news broadcaster voice in the cell we're in the cell all right bam we're in the cell but we don't want to be in the cell we want to go to the extracellular matrix party all the wild stuff happening up in here Woo, right that looks like a lot of fun actually it kind of reminds me of like a barbed wire fence or like, I don't know, some weird obstacle course that you have to get through. But anyway, that's just my personal thought. Um, this is what you need to realize. You have a lot of different stuff out there, man. You've got collagen out there. There's a stuff called fibronectin that's out there. You've got other proteins. Um, and then you have these things called proteoglycan complexes. Hold on. Okay, that pause was long. And I don't remember exactly where I was, but... I was talking about, I think, um, like the extracellular fluid. Oh, I know. I was saying like about how um, the collagen is there, how it kind of looks like a weird obstacle course. There's all this other like stuff that's out there. Really quickly, before I go back to the outside where we're, you know, having our extracellular matrix party, <laughs> we should look at very briefly, um, they label here microfilaments. So, so I just did it in yellow. Maybe red will work better. Bam. Oh yeah, that's better. So microfilaments. All of these um, twisted chains, they're microfilaments. Notice that they actually anchor themselves to the plasma membrane. So this fits perfectly with what we've been saying. The fact that you're, you need to export things, things need to be imported. And when they are, they have to find the appropriate um, track kind of to slide on. So that illustration is helpful if you were confused about how things would be leaving. And if we could go deeper into the cell, 100% sure that there would be connections to the Golgi. They, they, there would be connections to um, the smooth ER, the rough ER, any other place that you can think of. Okay, so back outside, we have um, these things that are on our like fake barbed wire fences, which are actually um, called proteoglycans. So let's do a word breakdown really quickly. When you hear proteo, we're referring to um, something that is made out of protein. Um, and proteoglycan is actually protein with so the the glycan part the gly part that's supposed to make you think about a carbohydrate and that's literally what it is so you have this polysaccharide molecule um that has 
a bunch of proteins that are like extending from it and then on those proteins again are more carbs um, so this structure here that's what the proteoglycan molecule is let's keep it moving all right so that was just the extracellular matrix you saw the stuff that was there you know that things are moving in and out and then the in and out movement is going to be helped along by some of those structures that we saw outside now let's talk about cells um, touching or joining each other so we have these things called cellular junctions and in order for one cell to be able to communicate with another it does so via like physical contact so that stuff in the extracellular matrix is the contact that we need. Um, in addition to that kind of contact, you have these things called intercellular junctions that help to move things from one cell to the other. We already have looked at the plasmodesmata um, in the plant cells. So remember, it was like those tunnel systems where you could kind of shift molecules from one plant cell to another these three tight junctions desmosomes gap junctions let's keep going and look at them we already did this plasmodesmata situation oh and then they list here what can go through the plasmodesmata so water small solutes sometimes some proteins some rna passing from plant cell to plant cell in the tight junctions, the desmosomes, and the gap junctions, we're talking about um, eukaryotic cells that are animal. So animal cells, three types of junctions, bam, there they are. So all of them we find in epithelial tissue. All right, let's look at an animation of what a desmosome is capable of. Notice before I hit play where we're looking so this is two cell membranes or two cells that are next to each other so you have the cell membrane of one and the cell membrane of another and you see this like interconnectedness that they have going on so let's check it out desmosomes or anchoring junctions appear as thickened patches in the cell membrane region between two cells Desmosomes contain specialized proteins such as keratin, the same protein found in fingernails and hair, that increase the rigidity of tissues. Desmosomes, such as those found in epithelium, smooth muscle, and many other animal tissues, are button-like junctions that bind cells together and also function as anchors for fibers in the cytoskeleton. All right, there's your desmosome notes. All right, let's look at gap junctions. In gap junctions, or communicating junctions, two cells are separated by a small gap, which is bridged by specialized channels that allow the passage of water and small molecules. Gap junctions help coordinate the activities of adjacent cells. For example, a hormone that stimulates one cell will often activate adjacent cells as well by the passage of intracellular signals through gap junctions. Last one, tight junctions. Tight junctions which bind cells together are found predominantly in epithelial tissues, such as the lining of the intestines. Tight junctions form a barrier that prevents fluids from moving between the intestinal space and the space between cells. <laughs> All right, that was it. So originally on this slide, Mr. Dumma came in the room and he was trying to like figure out how I was doing this. So we like recorded this really stupid video. It was in the bottom right hand corner, but it's completely removed now. Um, I re-recorded just because of how sick I sounded in the last one. I didn't want it to um, hinder your listening. So here we are this is all of these different um, connectors put together so you have the tight junctions um, they're showing you where you could find the desmosomes where you could also find the um, gap junctions they show you how small ions or small molecules and ions would move across the gap junctions um, for the desmosomes they're showing you the intermediate filaments that help to make those up so again those are a 
a type of cytoskeleton or cytoskeleton fiber and then last but not least you get a picture of um, those epithelial cells that may be in like the intestines as they have already said okay that's the end of this one catch you on the next one